Uh, what we expect today is one thing what we call the road to insights. Um, it's all about incitement, which is as such and also is to be respected. Uh, sometimes a chaotic process, but there is, um, I would say, a lot of numerous reasons to bring more structure uh, in that chaos. And that is our insights consulting, appro uh, consulting approach, which is about phasing, let's say, the fuzzy front end in different phases of uh, divergence and convergence. So I will I will elaborate on that one. And then uh, next, um, Niels will bring a, a client case um, uh, for that we did for Air France KLM, which is almost kind of a, a, a composition of different of those phases that I will uh, present. I would like to start and kick off with some of the quotes that we keep hearing uh, from our clients. Uh, it's all about we are sitting on a pile of research data and there is the, the thing and the topic of big data. And the, uh, every conference of, of market research is all about big data and how do we capture insight uh, from that uh, data. Um, on the other hand, what they also say is that they feel they don't have access to the data they need to generate new insight. So there is a lot of data, there is a lot of kind of tracking with, um, possibilities and, and impact measurement possibilities, but to really let's say extract new insight, it's hard to uh, get to the right uh, data. So then there is kind of desire at the, at the same end, which is about, yeah, we wish we could extract more insight from existing data. Um, but what we hear from clients is that they keep on collecting new data. So kind of a lot of, um, I would say, challenges to the industry and to, uh, to an agency as Insights Consulting to work with these, um, I would say, challenges within uh, on the client side uh, to help them to generate better and, and more uh, insight. Um, then on the next slide, what I show is the road to insights. Uh, my part will, will be all about kind of going, taking you through the different phases of uh, incitement uh, from the very early stages of scoping the project to actually activating that insight for innovation, for branding and for communication and all the steps uh, in between. So I will now take you through this step by step. Before doing that, I would like to tell you a bit how we as an agency approach these types of challenges and these types of, um, uh, let's say, uh, research journeys, I would say. Um, it's all about creating leverage with the research that we do. Uh, first of all, there is knowledge leverage. Uh, how do we not only empower, but also engage with consumers and, and, and specific consumers? And which tools do we use throughout the whole process to, um, let's say, make them think better, harder and faster? So that is that is one of our challenges that is has been also kind of the key of our R&D efforts in the, in the past years is to indeed get more out of the data, be creative with the tools and the, and the social media channels that we have available. And how do we leverage that um, into creating better insight? A second one, which is as challenging, uh, where the challenge is not in, in on the side of the of the participants or the consumer, but more on the part of the clients and, and the internal stakeholders. It's all about how do we engage not the consumer, but also team members and stakeholders throughout the process. Can be people within the team, can be people outside of the team. How do we engage even at the Department of uh, Public Relations within with, with this project and agencies and other stakeholders that we work with? Um, so how do we activate this insight, not only in a kind of a very nice and engaging workshop, but also beyond? How do we keep this insight alive within the organization? That is a second challenge. Again, there we have done many efforts and, um, and R&D efforts to kind of address this uh, challenge. And the last one is, I would say, the most human one. It's about when you do research, it's about designing that process in a way um, that you generate a conversation where the content for both consumers, but also for, let's say, the press or, um, or, or let's say, outside uh, outsider stakeholders. Um, and and I, can, I can send you a bunch of quotes, and I, did one, I didn't want to put them on a slide, but it's all about we are now doing uh, research and incitement for um, uh, skincare uh, with people on, uh, that have a problem skin. The reactions that you get with those people that say, wow, I'm, I, I feel proud again to, to look into the mirror and, and this research has, has, made, has had this effect uh, on me. That, that's the achieving something that goes beyond the scope of the research project. That is changing humans and, and, and bodies and minds and souls. And, and that is why we tap, or that is one of the reasons uh, why we achieve that, is because we tap into kind of emotional, um, emotional territories when doing incitement projects and deeply motivational um, areas. So again, there are three leverages where we believe that we as an agency are responsible to get the most out of the research um, that we do. 
So the first one is all about and often neglected or not um, taken uh, serious enough within uh, within within the companies is uh, scoping the project and connecting the dots. Uh, it's about and and it's about what do we already know, uh, what do we wish that we knew, and and that defines indeed the knowledge gaps that helps us to guide the research that we will do afterwards. Also, sometimes we are confronted with business with business challenges that are very broad and general. Like, okay, we want to increase penetration or we want to increase volume. That is that is very broad. That is indeed a business challenge, but on a, on a too much a meta level. So we need to bring that down to something that is actionable. Could be either in the type of innovation that you want to do. Could be we want to do something that relates to packaging. Could also be that you want a specific uh, uh, that you want to target a specific type of behavior. Let's say out of home consumption of a specific uh, category. That is where you come into an area where it's easier to already gather knowledge that you already have and to define the gaps that you um, uh, that you of knowledge that you don't uh, uh, have uh, today. We do that in a workshop format, uh, format which we call the leverage uh, uh, workshop, where we connect the dots. There is quite some pre-work uh, to it because we will uh, ask of all the participants to um, to go through some reports and results of, of previous research, um, or to maybe do some interviews with consumers themselves, and then we come into a workshop. And the first thing that we do is brain dump, uh, meaning structure what we already know, so the facts and and the things that we know. We put them on paper, we group them, we uh, we organize them into platforms and then the next thing is about okay what do we wish that we knew where are the kind of the the blind spots in um, in our current uh, uh, information uh, and knowledge systems so that is that is step one very important because it will also define who you will work with in the um, in the actual research it will define the expectations of the whole team member and it will also create some alignment and some excitement um, within the team and the and the the people that are uh, active in that workshop for the rest of the process because it's almost like a kickoff meeting that is internal then we switch to the participants to the consumers um, and we uh, we do a phase of immersion also maybe important to say is that given the challenges that i that i presented in in the start that's also why you will see an on and off button on each of the uh, of the phases is that sometimes when you say we want to work from existing data uh, and it does not require um, let's say additional immersion or ethnography then we can skip uh, certain phases or we can merge some phases or some uh, companies tell us oh we will skip the validation phase we feel confident to do that ourselves in a more qualitative way we don't need quantitative uh, validation so there is a choice and it's not a kind of a road that you have to follow each of the seven steps it's also kind of customizable as Niels will also show in his case uh, later today so the next is, uh, step is about generating the right uh, observations. Um, what, what is that about? It's about getting under the skin of the consumers. We do that online. Uh, so we use an individual ethnographic blog, almost like a diary uh, template, where on a daily basis um, they get questions, but more importantly tasks, because that's what we believe. What you do to people is almost as important or sometimes more important than what you ask uh, them. So that is... Uh, that is key in the way how we approach uh, ethnography and we also have um, let's say a principle when we go into observation that we do that for a longer time so mostly minimum two weeks um, because that requires uh, or that allows you to get more intimate and to kind of get acquainted with those consumers uh, it also allows you to disrupt a specific behavior so in the first week assume that this is a, a draft observation guide for our recent uh, skin uh, uh, skin research um, or skincare research the first week was all about observing current behavior okay just present yourself and your environment bring that consumer to life take a picture of what you like in your house what you like to do with your kids and with your uh, with, with your partner um, the next one is about your current skincare ritual what do you do try to capture that as detailed as possible could be with with visuals could be with video um, uh, whatever and then also evaluate the products that you use and and please select the top three and then kind of the, the three most loved ones and the three most uh, hated ones also take us along on a shopping trip within uh, the context of the category and tell us what you see take some pictures of the shelf that you really like and and uh, the specific elements that drive the appeal of that shelf the second week or the second phase of the ethnography, depending on the length of the of the of the study, is about disrupting behavior and perspective. Uh, again, there I can testify, based on the project that we are doing uh, today uh, at, at this time, where I'm involved in, it's you reach certain depths that I've never seen in, in other types of uh, research, uh, especially when you go to deprivation. 
meaning you let coffee add addicts not use coffee for a couple of days. You have people, in my case, uh, with, a, with, a, with a skin problem or a problem skin, not use, um, let's say, their product or their favorite product for a couple of days. Then you see kind of really emotional uh, behavior and reactions. Not only the deprivation as such, but also how people prepare for a deprivation already can be very insightful and how they feel after the deprivation and how they kind of reconnect with the category or with their favorite brand or product was also very uh, insightful. There is also not only disrupting behavior, but also disrupting perspective, meaning, okay, now you observe somebody else or let someone else observe uh, you. So all creative ways of, 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 of dealing with ethnography. And then uh, what, what, I, what I like to do also when you want to reveal frictions or, or insights that relate to packaging, for example, is about doing things under time pressure because that's how we as humans are. We adapt our behavior um, based on the flaws of the product that we use if we like that product. So just putting or doing things under time pressure will reveal frictions in a more um, explicit way. And this is just some of the tasks that we can give and depending again on the scope of the research and, and the objectives, we can, um, we can be very creative uh, in the way how we approach this. Um, of course, to do this, you need a good platform and you need a technology that allows you to connect with consumers. The platform is something that you see on the left. It's a, it's a personalized, either we brand it, either we make it a category, um, let's say, a, a driven, driven platform. But it's all about simplicity. It's about uh, connecting with consumers. On the right side, you see some of the elements that we use to uh, engage with consumers, where a very important one is mobile apps. Uh, more and more, um, the, the challenges or the business challenges that we have, they go beyond the, uh, let's say, the context of the house or the home. Uh, it's all about in the heat of the moment, uh, capturing of, of behavior and, and, and habits um, that can be out of home, can be on the go. Um, so we, we really rely on this mobile app to capture data on the go. Um, there is then the online blog, which is their safe haven. This is where they come back. This is where we post the tasks. Uh, they can access it through the mobile app but we cannot expect people to elaborate a lot in terms of comments that they give or stories that they tell on their mobile or smartphone. So we rely on that online blog as what we call indeed the basic uh, platform. Then for the client and for, for us as moderators, there is also what we call the cockpit. It is a way for you, because it's all individual blogs, it's a way for you to have a kind of an overview of all these individual participants and to just click on a name and then you get into their blog. So it's also a way for each of the uh, of the people within the organization to stay close to the to the consumer and to immerse with the consumer during the field work which in traditional ethnography is more kind of a, a right or a duty as you might uh, base uh, as you perceive it of the happy few so th there is budget and time and travel restrictions uh, that don't allow many people to connect with the actual consumer uh, in home while here it's not in home but you ac at least you connect with uh, with consumers so that is almost a pool way, so that's accessible 24-7. It's an online platform. There is also a way uh, where we push consumer news. So that is we as consultants and our moderators, they uh, pick out what we think are striking uh, observations or stories within the, uh, within the challenge of the research. And then we push them through channels, can be a closed Facebook group, can be a Twitter account, um, can be uh, email. So different push media that we use to keep that engagement alive and to already start conversations um, within the organization. Because for us, the debrief, or let's say the, the immersion uh, for the client starts uh, from day one of the field work, because that is when we already start generating data, which can be uh, interesting. So it's not waiting six weeks before you get the, the debrief or the workshop. The next step is, after this type of project, uh, if, if you connect with consumers in, in two weeks, uh, let's say 20 committed consumers, you generate a lot of data. So we talk about 1,500 uh, observations or 1,500 posts, uh, as we call it, um, it is, an, is not an exception. So that's a lot of data. And then the next step is to select meaningful observations, uh, which observations will lead most likely to insights. And we have a couple of tools uh, to help us uh, doing that, uh, which is either top down or either bottom up. In the top-down uh, tools, it's all about applying a specific vision on the category, applying specific frameworks or uh, ways of thinking within the organization, um, and that is the way how we categorize data. In the bottom-up, uh, uh, let's say, approach, we let the data speak. And 
an important tool that we use in both uh, act on both dimensions is text link uh, analytics. So categorizing data, imagine that we would do a research for um, coffee and we want to have um, uh, that, that, that we, we know that there is something interesting in the area of uh, decaf. Okay, so what we can do is say all the, the, the verbatims that we know relate to uh, decaf, we want to already kind of count them and make sure that we identify those observations or stories that relate to decaf coffee and the effects of decaf coffee. So that is what we call a, a top-down approach. We will search through all the posts um, and we will look at data that contain an element of, of decaf coffee. In the bottom-up approach, what we do there is we say, okay, we will let the data speak and see maybe if people talk about uh, not being able to sleep or sleepless nights, what is the context uh, around that specific uh, behavior? So that is the kind of the two ways to approach it, and that is text-linked analytics. But of course, we also rely on visual analysis and also uh, human analysis, maybe by pushing the consumer news, which is about four to five observations a day, if we feel that there is a lot of interest or kind of tension uh, or a lot of uh, attention is triggered with one of those observations, of course, we will consider that as being a meaningful uh, observation. Once you select the meaningful observation, it's about understanding and getting the most understanding out of these meaningful observations as possible. And you see the 360 degree uh, word there and how we try to achieve that is by empowering and engaging and involving the consumer also in this phase. So in the phase of analysis, which is traditional in our industry, something that is, um, that is, that is reserved for, uh, for the people uh, in the agency, for the, for the researchers, we say, hmm, let's be assisted or supported by the consumer uh, doing this. And there you see the, the definition of uh, crowd interpretation, which we apply more and more, and especially uh, is very useful in uh, ethnographic uh, uh, ethnography studies. Um, uh, what, what we have proven uh, by engaging consumers is that you add 20 to 40% additional interpretation slash insight from the same uh, data, So which, which is significant. It's what you did not see by eyeballing or what you did not see by by analyzing the data, but what other people uh, interpret. And maybe people that have that are better able to do that because they're closer in terms of, um, um, let's say, lifestyle or in terms of culture. Uh, so that is very key. And even more important is that th there is the same quality of interpretation. Um, again there, and you will be surprised if you see live examples, how well consumers uh, do this. It's, it's, it, it's, it's amazing. And in the industry of marketing and marketing research, what we acknowledge today is that people are, our consumers today are powerful marketeers. Uh, they know how to market things that we, are, we consider them as advocates and ambassadors, and we almost hand over some of the, of the marketing challenges. And there is still more reluctance to that uh, in, in the marketing research. But if you just do it and you let go of that control and you kind of look for that additional interpretation, it's al it always proves to be, I would say, shocking how good they are in interpreting uh, behavior or data. The next uh, step, very key again, um, and there it's all about um, less responsibility with the participant. It's more uh, where the client together with the agency takes over. It's trying to capture that consumer understanding um, in, in consumer insights. And that, that, is, that is, I think, the big challenge at the end of a lot of uh, processes. And this is all about first immerse and immersing not only during the field work, but also when you set up a workshop um, uh, where Again, in the first phase, you confront everyone with, with some of the observations. It's about converging in the next stage, digesting a lot of that information, look at it from different perspectives, clustering and structuring uh, that information. And in the end, I know it is a fuzzy, uh, a fuzzy process, but we have indeed a workshop format, which takes one to two days where you have those different phases of immersion, clustering, organizing into insight platforms, and then writing uh, uh, insights for that specific platform. What we believe and what we wor watch over, uh, watch out for during the workshop is that a consumer insight should contain three elements. It's about an element of freshness. It should be a new way of looking at things, uh, not only within the company, but also within the industry. If you feel that, that something is already addressed by, by one of your key competitors, then probably it's less new, um, uh, new or less useful or it has lower potential for you as a company. 
the key is still about relevance. You have to be relevant uh, uh, for consumers. Um, but we consider relevance kind of a dual, uh, um, a, a dual thing. It can be relevant for you personally, but it can also be relevant because of your social context. If you hear a lot of people talking about an issue, if you feel that there is a lot of buzz around a specific issue or friction around you, that is also considered to be uh, uh, relevant. And that can help in the way how you measure uh, relevance is by projecting it to your peers, uh, to your social group, uh, because sometimes you are dealing with kind of socially undesirable uh, insights or formulations about fear or negative emotions, and then it's easier to protect it to the peers or to the crowd. And then the last one is about, am I excited about the solution? Is this something that I would w want a, a company to work on in terms of a, a solution or that, that we believe that it's worth communicating about um, in a campaign. When you fulfill those three uh, rules, I would say there is the key to success. And then you have a platform that can either inspire for innovation, for branding, for communication, or even uh, just um, activation. So there is, that, is, that is for us the key definition or the rules to have a good uh, consumer insight, which requires, as I said, a lot of discipline. And it's keeping that consumer alive, because if you don't keep that consumer on the table, literally, in that workshop, you see that you kind of float away to all the assumptions and to um, uh, non-consumer language. So we are there and we have the tools um, to, to access raw data in terms of consumer stories, even during the insight, um, uh, insighting workshop. And then the next phase, it's about validating and prioritizing consumer insights. Um, what we do see is that we, there is a lot of assumptions in companies, w which one you should, pr should pursue and which one not. What we have proven with some of the clients that we do the validation with is that that does not always correspond with the consumer opinion. So it's definitely worthwhile to do a quantitative validation that allows you to prioritize the consumer insights. And 60 consumer insights can be right or can be true. It's about selecting those ones that you want to pursue and that you want to make into a project and proceed with uh, through the innovation funnel. So that is the, that is the objective of this um, uh, validation. Um, it's about proving that they are based on, uh, on existing consumer needs and uh, selecting those needs with the highest potential to influence consumer uh, and future behavior. Um, again, we have proved that, that this works and that is impactful and even impacting the bottom line. It's about increasing the success rate of concepts measured as a top two box <coughs> score, I'm sorry, for uh, almost uh, uh, 20%. And what our clients also like is the fact that it creates a kind of a discipline. There is a discipline not only in agreeing on what an insight is and keeping that alive within your organization, it's also creating a discipline of letting go of certain assumptions that do not hold. And, and there is uh, literally, you are confronted if you do this uh, with us, we have four core KPIs with a lot of diagnostics uh, on top. <coughs> I'm sorry where um, you are confronted with, with traffic lights, which a lot of uh, our clients like to see because it, it, it gives you confidence in do we have to pursue this or should we rule this out of, uh, out of the funnel and should we read it out of the funnel. So apart from that, key diagnostics and, and giving you an idea of should we pursue with this, uh, is it a good basis uh, to, do, to start ideation or not? We also give you more uh, input on drivers and barriers. What is driving the relevance of this specific um, insight? We also give you an indication of the emotional territory that you're playing with. And from meta learnings show us that tapping into a negative emotion, which we know, um, and that's almost a, a common rule, is, is never as successful as tapping into positive emotions. So it's indeed changing even addressing the same friction, it's trying to twist it around into a positive uh, emotion. Um, and even within the positive emotions, there is different uh, dimensions. We also have the tools that allows you to, <coughs> to target uh, better the specific insight. Um, you can address a target group, but it's always interesting to know which niche, niche you are appealing to um, uh, most. And then very key is also brand fit and by extension category fit. Do consumers perceive us as a brand that should address this specific insight? Or is there an insight that uh, fits way better with uh, one of our key competitors? And then the last step is about insight activation, which is two dimensions. One is how do you activate that insight on that 
single moment in time, which we call the workshop, um, the ideation workshop, where it's all about creating and, and bringing that insight to life in, in, in product solutions and, and, and communication concepts. The next one is how do you keep that inside alive after uh, the workshop and over time? So again there, the workshops and Niels will explain you also a little bit uh, because this is a picture from the same workshop as he will uh, also present, which is the AF KLM uh, workshop. So we know this typical workshops, which is about one day, two day, um, uh, where the two day allows you to also do overnight uh, idea screening, which is something that we apply now for some of our clients, uh, where you know how it goes. We have two days after day one, you have 150 post-its there and then you start day two with um, putting stickers on the ideas that you like and again relying on internal perspective to select the ideas to proceed uh, through the innovation funnel and to write into concepts. We say hmm, maybe it's this is a very crucial part in the, in the whole uh, uh, process and the journey and maybe we should involve consumers there. So in these workshops, in the core, it's all about creativity and creativity techniques and brainstorming. But let's say our uh, our positioning within that agency uh, within within that workshop is that we keep the consumer alive, the participant. We make sure that we are still kind of connecting with the consumer insight. We make sure that we validate uh, uh, in a way that also the consumer approves of our decisions. Another way to to go about it is um, apart from the workshop where you create, let's say, with people within the organization or some of your agencies, is also to do that with participants or community uh, community members. So, which is co-creation community. With a, with a key advantage is that you already have a kind of a validation, ongoing validation, and and immediate feedback on the ideas that you put in um, uh, put in that community. You also have bottom-up ideas. Also. Consumers can be creative in the ideas that they come up with. Um, and, and also how we work is we engage with two types of profiles. One is the innovators and influentials. And innovators is more, they are both early adopters, um, but the one is, is the motivation to uh, adopt early for the innovators is more an intrinsic perspective. I am interested in, it, in this. I am very engaged with the category. I like coffee, I know everything about coffee and I want to know everything about coffee. So that is more the innovative profile. The influential profile is typically those ones that have a more a social, um, uh, a social role within uh, the diffusion of adoption of innovations. Um, so those are the people that say, well, I'm pretty influential. People come and ask me for advice um, within the specific category. And we have developed a scale to separate the ones for the other. And it's always good to have a mix of both in your, um, in your community. And then I'm just going back to the to the challenges that we had at the beginning of, of, of the research, which is, um, I think, something that you all uh, recognize. Um, and then it's about keeping inside alive. How do we build further on something that we have already done and how do we recycle information that we already have? Um, that is why after such a project, we advise uh, to set up a Consumer Connect website. It's not as easy because it has to fit within current knowledge sharing um, um, practices that you have within the company. But the concept is, is very clear. It's about make sure that it is obvious which uh, were the in winning insights. Also publish updates in the context of the study. Maybe you did indeed a co-creation community. Just post the ideas that came out of this uh, community. It's also about creating a social currency within the company and not, not only a water cooler or a coffee corner conversation, but also online conversations, because we link this to a blog and a kind of a community where people discuss um, not only the insights, but also the ideas that, that uh, flow, uh, flow, flow out of this uh, insight. And important is also that you still have the possibility to access raw consumer story stories. So the data of the ethnography is still available in an easy to use format. We have done extensive tagging uh, before we post it on this um, uh, website. So you can look on, uh, let's say, okay, we are launching a product um, one year later and we still want to access, let's say, consumer language and uh, raw consumer stories uh, and, and uh, regarding a specific insight. This allows you to do this, um, uh, which is uh, often used by, uh, let's say, advertising agencies later on in the, in the process without ha doing an, an immersion all over again, just uh, recycle the data that you already have. And this is a, a screenshot of how such a database uh, looks like. And I want to end with a quote, uh, for my part at least, um, which is from uh, uh, Paul Stanger, um, uh, uh, someone that I really love working with, and he is Global Innovation Manager for Heineken, um, who 
who says that indeed that insights approach or and and again there we do not do the whole funnel it's not the whole road of insights that we do with them it's specific parts that they engage us with uh, with so it's not all or nothing um, they say but insights and the contribution that we have has really helped us to understand not only understand consumer motivations uh, better um, but also prioritize and make decisions that are more consumer-led um, this is also a client where we do the overnight idea screening uh, in workshops and and that is what they really appreciate us for and what what makes us probably a good partner for a company like Heineken that wishes to have that consumer at the core of their um, fuzzy front end so now I will uh, hand over to Niels, who will uh, talk about one, uh, one case, uh, the, the AFKLM case, which, uh, which will contain certain elements of what I just explained. Well, thank you very much, uh, Philip, for uh, that very thorough introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, as Philip just mentioned, I will illustrate a case that we recently conducted for Air France KLM. Um, <coughs> the presentation is based on a paper that was presented at the SMR World Qualitative Conference last month. Um, and um, it's a fraction out of there. So there's more in that paper. If you would be interested, we would be more than happy to uh, show you the way on our website of how you can uh, get to uh, the paper. Anyway, the topic of it was that Air France KLM came to us and asked us, you know, they wanted to really get an insight and an understanding of the um, flight transfer experience among frequent flyers. So basically, the goal was to uh, define frictions and unmet needs on the one hand, and in the second phase, come up with uh, you know optimized transfer services uh, for people uh, flying internationally. Now imagine the following situation. Suppose I would ask you to book a flight from the U.S. to Australia. Now probably the first thing that would come to mind is some very idyllic uh, pictures of Barrier Reef or Sydney or any other touristy attraction that you would be uh, seeing over there and probably a lot of good things that would pop up. However, going from the reality that you are in right now to being in uh, Australia, there is a lot of things that need to happen, a lot of things that will happen that you would rather want to skip, that probably um, things you would not really choose uh, to happen to you. For example, the first thing that could happen is if you get into your car, you're stuck in a traffic jam. So there's a, a lot of things that um, if you fly from the U.S. to Australia, that can happen. And most probably one of those things that will happen is because of uh, cost reasons, because of timing, because of the simple fact that, you know, where you are based, there is no other option. You will have to deal with a transfer, a transfer from one terminal to the other, one flight uh, plane, airplane to the other. In any case, a process with a lot of stakeholders, a lot of risk and a lot of complexity. So basically the uh, outtake that we, or you know, the, the, the point of departure that we wanted in this project was what if we can introduce positive brand experiences, moments that are delight evoking for passengers and how can we use those, how can we identify those um, and how can we you know, tailor uh, solutions for them. So in such situations, such complex situations involving multiple stakeholders, it's clear for us, and this case will show that, that customers or key customers can really help you make the difference in coming up with innovations. Now, the whole study was a, as you will see if you would read the whole paper, uh, an integrated uh, methodology with using qualitative elements, um, using quantitative uh, methods involving uh, consumers, but also uh, internal uh, people at Air France KLM, both from the R&D department as well as from the consumer insight department. But the backbone of everything was what we call a market research online community. Now, a market research online community, uh, which had phases of one-to-one -one or one-on-one -on -one observation, as well as peer-to-peer -peer, uh, discussion. In any case, uh, market research online communities uh, basically mean that you engage with consumers asynchronically over time and you structurally collaborate with them um, towards, um, towards solutions. Now, the first phase was really incitement, and that was focusing on observation uh, for insight discovery, call it uh, unmet needs and frictions throughout the transfer flight process. The second phase was one where we went from unmet needs to developing more solutions, um, co-created with uh, consumers as well as stakeholders at Air France KLM. 
What did happen, though, is that we went from this observation into the second phase of ideation and concept development uh, to, uh, you know, go much more in depth and basically start off uh, from the findings that we had in the first phase, so really applying a form of consecutive uh, learning in here. A third phase of the study uh, is one where we validated very concrete concepts uh, in a quantitative way, and that was done uh, using a quantitative methodology in four countries with a representative sample of frequent flyers, where we also measured um, emotions. I will not elaborate on, on that phase. Um, it's, uh, there, there's a lot more detail in the paper, but since we're really talking about the more fuzzy front end of, of you know, innovation, um, this is a little bit out of the scope of, um, of, of, the, of the presentation today. But we would be more than happy to provide you more information uh, about this and how we do this if you would uh, want to. So let's take a deeper look at this first phase of observation, um, that first stage of insight discovery. As Philip already mentioned, the very first step that we take is really you're sitting on that pile of data. How can we leverage that? There's so much available in companies. And if we only knew what we already know, that would be a huge leap forward. And uh, that's what we tried to do. We try to make that uh, knowledge surface uh, it helps us identify tacit knowledge as well. There's a lot of things that come from previous research, but a lot of the knowledge that we have in our companies in the, is in the heads of people. Sometimes it's assumptions, some sense it, it, it's intuition, it's, it's based on experience, but the knowledge is there. It also helps us tremendously at this point of the, of the project to keep focus and to decide what to do and what not to do. So we start off with a uh, connecting the dots uh, workshop as Philip uh, illustrated. And basically what it, this is, is it's nothing more than a, a very elaborate brainstorm session um, uh, that goes in, in, in very, very, very depth with different stakeholders uh, all over uh, the company. Now, uh, what we do apply there is very traditional uh, qualitative research techniques. Uh, one of the things that you see here is a board game <coughs> where, for example, we um, start off and everybody gets um, a card with a persona and that is a specific person, for example, who is described as a technology savvy uh, fly, frequent flyer. But you advance through uh, the board and you, you know, everybody does that and everybody's generating ideas, but all of a sudden you get a card that changes the context, which means that that person um, you now know is coming back from a long business trip that lasted three weeks and the person, the guy really misses his family. So by, by, by laying assumptions out, generating ideas, and all of a sudden changing the context, you get more um, you get more out of it. Now, what are the results? In this case here, we were able to recycle insights from previous research and, and take that along into the study that we did. We had a very good understanding of what the current marketing assumptions were among the R&D group as well as the consumer insight group. And in a very concrete sense, we uh, were able to um, identify 26 insights, as Philip defined them, uh, clustered around five insult platforms because they were uh, very similar. So then we, uh, this, this was kind of the first internal uh, leverage that we created to start and kick off the project in a very interactive and thorough way. Then, of course, the big bulk of it was um, the insightment community. And the insightment community uh, consisted of three phases. The first phase was uh, blog-based, if you want. Um, it's, uh, it was really about following uh, passengers uh, on their journey. Uh, more concretely, this was done with 39 frequent flyers who, rep who really reported a very, you know, a real life experience, one, one that they really lived. So it wasn't based on, um, on, on, on uh, recall or, or, you know, thinking back about a collective memory of transfers that they had. No, in fact, people were recruited such that in the three weeks after they were recruited, they would actually go through and be able to report back a transfer flight experience. It generated a lot of text and a lot of pictures, um, a lot of uh, unstructured information, which really immersed us into the world of um, transferring uh, of, 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 passion of passengers. The uh, second phase, though, that we did in the inside community is that we said, okay, we have all of these very unstructured, chaotic, diversified, very rich information. And we applied, as Philip explained, the method of crowd interpretation. 
And the method of crowd interpretation is basically you throw back findings from consumers and you ask them to interpret, you know, what do you see? What do you think is happening? And what would you uh, be doing in that situation? And then to uh, what we call auto drive and shape the insight and, and structure it, we would of course then have a discussion which would really be probing onto what's really happening here and create uh, more knowledge in that perspective. In doing so, we give people challenges, and that's how we create that um, knowledge leverage that, that Philip uh, referred to. But on the other hand, at the same time of this happening, we also created internal leverage at Air France KLM. And the way we did this here was to set up what we call consumer news. And consumer news is nothing else than a some kind of pushed information stream uh, by means of new newsletters uh, with the most striking and refreshing consumer stories of the day that we got. Some very... Um, concrete stories um, to create a better connection between the marketeers and the R&D people at Air France KLM to better connect with their consumers. In fact, everybody had the opportunity uh, among um, the stakeholders, everybody had the opportunity to actually follow a patient from door to door, literally from packing their luggage to arriving at their destination. Now, what were the results of this uh, first phase of, of immersion? Well, first of all, um, what you see here is a screenshot of, of the uh, consumer story dashboard that Philip referred to, uh, which is nothing else than a huge database of, in this case, over a thousand stories and pictures that were tagged and structured by consumers in a predefined or along a predefined uh, set of qualitative uh, codes. So it's a way of uh, interactive reporting format, and you can basically literally filter out through the visual data and say, okay, Give me everything in terms of all the photos, uh, international airports compared to uh, national airports, or uh, people that have already had a, had a long haul flight versus people that have just had a short flight and are doing their transfer. So uh, type of frequent flyer. So you could really browse through this information and it brings up uh, a lot of rich information. So that's a first result or a first deliverable if you want very concretely of that first phase. Secondly, remember we had 26 insights that we defined at the start of the project. Well, we leveraged this up to 68 insights, uh, which is an increase of over 60% just based on um, those uh, that consumer interaction. So we're talking about unique insights that came from here. And similarly, instead of having five insight platforms, we now had 10 insight platforms. Another aspect was that in the beginning in the Connecting the Dots workshop, we identified marketing assumptions, as I said. Well, six out of those marketing assumptions were revised. We didn't really feel momentum of those assumptions of being reality uh, based on the consumer input that we had. So that's also good. It, it puts the noses in a little bit of a different, um, in a little bit of a different direction. On the other hand, the crowd interpretation also gave us uh, over 20% unique and more in-depth uh, insights uh, using um, this uh, methodology. So a lot of concrete results that came out of this. Go into a sec going into a second phase, what we did here is we uh, did a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, concept development uh, community with um, 46 new frequent flyers who were all innovators in the area and who really discussed on um, the findings that we got uh, from, from the previous phase. So this was more much more based on finding solutions uh, and probing rather than just uh, observing. And it, all in all, this generated 32 new transfer concept ideas for Air France KLM. And uh, one of the core solutions of this uh, as a tool that we, that we use is a co-creation uh, interaction or a co-creation challenge that we give people. So we give them uh, insights and we ask them to come up with very specific solutions. The way we do it is that people can really post their, um, their ideas and they can also, by contributing on a specific idea, they can give an idea a certain status, being from a very rough diamond to a shaped diamond all the way up into a diamond ring based on the detail and the level of detail that they're actually given to a specific idea and the depth with which they uh, developed, it, developed it. And we, we really found that, that this worked very well. Um, we, we found that if you give uh, ideas a status, it makes things concrete for uh, participants. Something else that made it very concrete is that um, 
of course, there's no competition without uh, a reward if you want. And the most popular ideas, the ones that, that, that had the highest status of all, we uh, basically visualized them um, in, in, you know, well, we visualized them and threw them back into the community and they were visualized by uh, an industrial designer. And you can see an example here on this slide. And we really felt that this is a very tangible, intrinsic reward for participants, which creates a wow feeling uh, among them. What we also did in terms of creating the uh, internal leverage is that we had highlight meetings, mailings, what we called them, um, about the uh, co-creation exercise. So the most striking ideas, we already can make, communicate them to the Air France KLM uh, team to keep the momentum going. Uh, finally, if you look at the, these uh, visualized ideas, we were obviously able to take them uh, and leverage them into the next steps of our final delivery in this project, which was you know, ideation sessions uh, and insight writing sessions among or along specific guidelines. And the fact of the matter is that we often forget that um, research should be uh, create change. And uh, people at, at, at the client side are also consumers, especially uh, at Air France KLM. These people are very frequent flyers. So what we did is um, we, we, we did co-creation workshops. Uh, we identified and finally tested four concepts in a uh, very in a, in a quantitative way. We did so along, um, you know, concept writing uh, guidelines. But one of the other things that we did is we generated these uh, so-called, you know, deck of idea cards that were that are now sitting on on the table uh, of every meeting that this group of stakeholders have. And while we were not able to um, develop all of these concepts to the fullest, they have, you know, taken the commitment to basically each meeting they have with the same people to take one idea and take about 15 to four, uh, 30 minutes to discuss about them and further create uh, and co-create and deep dive any of the ideas that we had. So this is another example of internal leverage where you really try to keep or we really try to keep the research alive beyond um, the half hour uh, workshop. So as a conclusion, leaving some room for, for questions and answers uh, after this, um, market research uh, online communities really uh, allow you to go from you know, one stage to the other. And very concretely, um, uh, Air France KLM is now working on a mobile transfer app where they added uh, new features based on our consumer feedback. They changed the video that they now show on board of explaining what people should do and not do and give some tips and tricks on how to make the transfer process as easy as possible. Um, and they also are, are working on a new concept, which they call the agent of the future, which really um, helps consumer make the transfer uh, even better. So uh, involve consumers um, and connect them with multiple stakeholders uh, really helps in the very fuzzy front end of, of innovation. Uh, your key customers are an important partner in crime, as I just illustrated. They are very uh, motivated and, and, um, and willing to help out and very involved. And it's not only about delivering those, you know, that deck of slides. I showed you the deck of ideas, uh, the highlight mailings, the interactive uh, consumer dashboard. It, it's more than this. And, and it's about making uh, research uh, actionable as well as uh, fun at the same time. So this is the uh, uh, summary of, of, of this case. And uh, both Philip and I would be more than happy to take uh, any questions uh, you may have. Um, thank you very much. see someone is, uh, is typing for, for a question. Uh, please don't hesitate. If you would have any other questions, um, then uh, of course, also after uh, this session, Philip and I uh, are available. Uh, if you would want more information, uh, we would be more than happy to uh, provide that um, as you wish. I see the person is uh, still typing. Did you meet face to face? with any of the participants in this case, or was it 100% online? Uh, this, this, is, this was indeed 100% uh, online uh, engagement. Now, we have done uh, projects where we feel that it's important or, or uh, an added value of inviting consumers into co-creation workshops. And um, we, um, we have done it for clients here where we, um, where we had a physical meeting with well, ad agencies, um, the market, marketing people, 
uh, people people from from the research departments, and we mix them up with uh, with clients. Uh, we have also uh, experimented with having people uh, engage in an online interactive chat session during a co-creation workshop. Of course, there's um, s some challenges to that, such as, as proximity. Um, when you do it, you know, when you do a co-creation workshop during business hours, people need to be available. Um, things like that, but it, it could add some 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 value to it, um, and it's definitely uh, an experience of it. Now, what we also try to do is um, is is really to um, get a consumer connection going so that people are, you know, at the client side are, are, are really able to follow um, specific people and they get a good picture of who they are. So we do try to sketch a very illustrative picture uh, online such that we not necessarily always need to have an offline uh, connection. Uh, why wasn't it n necessary for, for, for this case? Well, as I just said, the, the richness of the data that we get, we just don't ask people to post one photo. We really, in this case, uh, ask them to really report on a step-by-step -step basis, to take a picture, uh, add a storyline, add text. Um, and, and your unit of, I mean, as I said, we, we had with, with, with 40 or 39 frequent flyers, we had over a, a, a thousand um, pictures and stories. So that's so illustrative that, 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 you know, it's such a richness of data that it's not necessarily uh, needed. Uh, we do sometimes go into um, uh, synchronous chat sessions if, if, if that's needed uh, to, to make a, a deep dive uh, onto specific uh, assumptions. That yeah, I would like to add to this as well. So uh, and I think it's also asking for the comparison with kind of offline in-home ethnography and, and how this kind of relates to that in terms of depth of richness. I think there is two things. Whenever we do this, Clients are surprised by the depth, uh, by the depth of, of, the of the observations and the findings that we get out of online uh, and visual ethnography. So that, that is number one. Um, number two is that we do it in two weeks, which again reaches, although it's online, which might be even an advantage from that perspective, is we generate a level of, of intimacy with that participant that you cannot reach in a one-day in-home ethnography. We also avoid what we call the Hawthorne effect, which is kind of changing your behavior because there is a there is there is the that that kind of very conscious uh, finding that there is someone watching over your back or, or in, in your living room. So there is a lot of, of those effects. And from another perspective, a lot of our clients say, well, we do all our ethnography in the US because we cannot permit ourselves to do this globally, although we feel the need to do this more and more in global markets, emerging markets. But we cannot travel with a whole team of 10 people across the globe and uh, across 10 different regions in India and, and make this happen operationally and budget-wise. So that is, that, is a, that is an even stronger argument, I think, to uh, why companies more and more switch to online ethnography while maintaining the quality of, uh, of results and data. Any other questions? All right. Everything was clear, then I think we can close down. Uh, we are five minutes early, so that's good. Some people will be after lunchtime, some people will be in lunchtime, and some people will be close to lunchtime. So I wish you all a happy day, and um, let's uh, connect later. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.